Bon matin. Bon matin. Good morning. Good morning. Bon matin. Bienvenue au sommet de l'Association médicale canadienne sur la santé. Je m'appelle Adrian Harewood et je serai votre maître de cérémonie pour le sommet. Good morning and welcome to the 2023 CMA Health Summit. My name is Adrian Harewood and I will be your host and one of your moderators for the conference. And welcome to Ottawa. Welcome to Ottawa, the nation's capital. Bienvenue. You know, I'm really proud of this town because Ottawa is my hometown, right? This is a place I call home. Um, I was born in 19, I, I won't say exactly when I was born, but, but let, let's just say that I, I'm old enough to have attended a graduation ceremony where Tommy Douglas was the commencement speaker. All right, that's how old I am. I am old enough to remember Monique Bégin. Does anyone here remember Monique Bégin? Yes, Canada's former Minister of Health and Welfare. So I remember Monique, who of course helped to introduce the Canada Health Act as well. So I'm old. We like to call Ottawa the city of champions. And I know some of you from Montreal and Edmonton and St. John's and Vancouver and Toronto in particular are snickering right now. But the Ottawa Senators have won 11 Stanley Cups. Now, the, the, last time, the last time they won a Stanley Cup is in 1927, right? But they've won 11 Stanley Cups. And of course, the Ottawa Red Blacks won the Grey Cup in 2016. Paul Anka is from Ottawa. You know, Alanis Morissette as well. So we come by the name City of Champions, honestly. For vir virtual participants to the summit, a warm welcome to you. We have participants from coast to coast to coast. And I know for West Coast participants, this is truly an early start for your day. Um, I just wanted to quickly get a sense as to who is in the room. So I'm going to go through all the territories and provinces. And when I mention your territory and province, I want you to say, that's me. Okay? Yukon. <laughs> Northwest Territories. Nunavut, British Columbia, okay, BC's in the house, Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, Ontario, Quebec, New Brunswick, they're not shy. Nova Scotia, Prince Edward Island, and Newfoundland and Labrador. Okay, we are all here. It's great to have you all here. Now, in the context of CMA, CME accreditation requirements, I, Adrian Harewood, have declared the affiliations projected on the screen. Now, before I proceed, I want to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you from the traditional territories of the Anishinaabe Algonquin Nation, whose presence here reaches back to time immemorial. For those joining us from different parts of the country, I'd like to acknowledge that we are on many treaty lands and unceded territories. We're grateful to be face-to-face -face once again. Isn't it good to be face-to-face -face in person? For the first time in four years, with so many of you, physicians, medical learners, people with lived experience, policymakers, and health care partners, we are together once again. We're also excited to have hundreds more joining us virtually to share their valuable perspectives on what health care should be, our theme for the next two days. And I'm pleased to note that the Health Summit is a patient's included conference, which means that patients with lived experience participated in its design and its planning. Now, I hope most of you have logged into our conference app. Uh, the link and login credentials were emailed to you earlier this week. 
If you need help, please see our staff at the registration desk during the next break. The conference app contains all the information you'll need to keep track of the sessions, and this is your ticket to engaging with panelists, whether through interactive polling or by asking and upvoting questions. So if you want to get your smartphones out, let's try out a poll question together and get warmed up. So, I'm going to ask that we start the poll. And the question is, what part of the healthcare system are you representing today? Number one is physicians. Number two is medical students or residents. Number three is health professionals. Number four, patients, caregivers. Number five, healthcare organizations. And number six is other. Okay, hopefully everyone is done by now. Yes? Okay. Okay, so we're going to close the poll and we should be getting the results in a few seconds from now. Okay, so physicians, so to the question, what part of the healthcare system are you representing today? 37% of participants today are physicians, 10% are health professionals, 7% are medical students or residents, 12% are patients and caregivers, 22% are healthcare organizations, and 12% our other. Okay, so we have a sense of who is in the room. A reminder that when engaging on the app, both in the live chat and through the Q&A function, we ask that everyone support a respectful, professional, and collaborative discussion. Questions and comments that are discriminatory, defamatory, abusive, or offensive, or that violate privacy or confidentiality will not be addressed. Will not be addressed. Well, I have the distinct honor right now to introduce Elder Claudette Commanda, who will be delivering a blessing. Claudette is an Algonquin Anishinaabe from Kirigan Zibi, Anishinaabe First Nation in Quebec, and has dedicated more than 35 years to promoting First Nations people's rights history, and culture in national and international settings. Claudette Commanda is a University of Ottawa law professor. She became the first Indigenous leader ever appointed Chancellor last November. Please welcome Elder Commanda. Bonjour tout le monde. Good morning. Come on, more enthusiasm. Good morning. Right on. <laughs> I was walking here this morning and I said, who has a conference at 8 o'clock in the morning? I said, oh yeah, doctors, that's right. <laughs> doctors don't sleep. You're on call 24 hours, seven days uh, a week, 365 days. So you know what it is, eh? Lack of, lack of sleep. And you know how precious time is, right? So that's why you start your conference at 8 o'clock. But I'm glad that we started a little bit late because it gave us time to breathe, have that extra cup of coffee, say good morning to one another, get the technical work going, and here we are. So kwe shiba, good morning to each and every one of you. As Adrian... He doesn't look old at all. You still look like a teenager. There you go. Now I look old, and I can tell you when I was born, but I'm not. But <laughs> when everyone is going through, like, you know, I'm, uh, you know, when you called out the province, uh, what was the word that you had to say, I'm here? What? Oh, well, this is me. 
Claudette Commander here standing with you. So I'm very proud to be here representing my nation. Kani Mitch Kijigun Kinun Indishnikas Kitaganzi Bidonjibon. Pijaji Koma Nishnabe Ki Omama Weni Nibug. Mi Gwej Kibija Yego Ma Nongum. Nibuk Sendam Chimino Togzu in Onje Nongum Ashishwa Bang. Bonjour tout le monde, bonjour. Mon nom c'est Claudette Commander, je suis une femme algonquin de la Première Nation. Comme d'habitude, je suis toujours, toujours très fière pour donner des mots à Bévenu, puis Bévenu ici, le territoire non cédé de la nation algonquin. I'm always honored, always proud to bring forth greetings and as well as a welcome to all the visitors, family and friends, your community of health professions, relatives, from Indigenous peoples from coast to coast to coast and all Canadians. Welcome to this beautiful homeland of the Algonquin people. This homeland that we considered unsurrendered, unseated. The homeland that the Creator entrusted onto us since time immemorial. And the homeland that we must ensure will be here forevermore for our children today and tomorrow and those seven generations that will come. And in our teachings, in our way of knowing and being and doing, in our creation stories, in our laws, we speak about all peoples. We speak of all peoples of the world. And each and every one of you are in our medicine wheel. And that medicine wheel speaks of life. Pima de Zewin. And our word in Algonquin for health is mino. Mino pima de Zewin. That good life. And when we say mino pima de Zewin, and when we say that good life, it speaks about our spirit, our emotions, our intellect, and our physical, and all that we need to be healthy and sustainable as healthy individuals for self, for family, for community, for nation. And each and every one of us in our own way, we are healers. We are healers. And I commend each and every one of you doctors and medical students and those who support the medical profession and work in the medical profession. You come together as a community and that community is of healing and it is important to healing to bring that good source of daily health to one another, to your patients, to the community, and that's so important. In our way of knowing and in being and doing and our protocols as Anishinaabe people, we must always welcome visitors into our homeland. And our next protocol is, and responsibility is to always acknowledge the first ancestors, the ancestors of the land. And I say to my ancestors, I thank my ancestors. I thank my ancestors for their love and their kindness and their prayers that they give each and every day in order for me to be here. And as I acknowledge my ancestors, I acknowledge the ancestors of Indigenous peoples from coast to coast to coast. But I always acknowledge as well each and every one of you, all of you, no matter where you've come from, your ancestors. Our ancestors are important. Our ancestors were here before us. And to know who we are is important, to know where we come from. Because that is important, to know where we are going. It's life. Life that continues forevermore. So I acknowledge all the ancestors, from my ancestors to your ancestors, and what we are doing here today, Indigenous peoples and Canadians, Indigenous doctors and Canadian doctors, we're here together in this circle of community, community. And let's always walk that road together, because when you're thinking of health, it must always be in that good frame of mind with love and kindness and respect. And the other responsibility when we come together, we acknowledge one another with that good spirit and the way that I was taught by my relatives, by my grandparents, is when we welcome visitors into our homeland, we must always give them a blessing too as well. And at this time, I offer each and every one of you to be part of this circle, what we call prayer, but we call it imiyawin. We come together to sing that song of our heart because that word imiyawin in the Algonquin language means to chant. So our prayer is a song of our heart. 
I ask each and every one of you to join me in this prayer and to say your prayer in the way that you are comfortable, in the way that you believe. I acknowledge each and every one of you. And for those who want to stand, you may stand. For those that want to be seated, remain seated. What's important is the Creator sees and knows and feels our heart. And let us say our words with that truest love and kindness to one another and to acknowledge the Great Spirit for His blessing. As I say, Chimi Gwej Kishiminado, Kichimi Gwej Onje Nongum, Chimi Gwej. We thank you, Creator, for your blessing. Kichimi Gwej Kokomista Pekizis, Mi Gwej Mishomis Kizis, Mi Gwej Jojo Eki. Creator, together as one with that one voice and that one heart, we acknowledge that first grandparents who you blessed all peoples of the world with. We thank our grandfather, the sun, and we thank our grandmother, the moon. And Creator, with that one voice and that one heart and that one mind and that one spirit, all peoples, we thank you, Creator, for that one mother whom you blessed all peoples of the world with. We thank our mother, the earth. For without our mother the earth, we would not have the water life, the plant life, the medicine life, and our relatives, the animals, and one another as brothers and sisters in this great circle called the family. Chi mi to our mother the earth. Jojo eki. Mi gwej kishimina do onje kaki na. Ni buksendam chimino tagazuin onje nongum ashishwa bang. Ni buksendam ni baka win a shishmana jita wa win, me gwej kishiminado. Ni buksendam mashkaw is win onje kakina. Me gwej ni jen wan dagada. Chi me gwej kishiminado onje onje zagi e duin. Creator, as brothers and sisters in this circle, as healers, as family, as friends, as community members, and as professionals, we thank you, Creator for the greatest gift that you've blessed us with each and every day, life. And we thank you for your love. And my prayer, Creator, for all who are here to bless their, their meeting today and tomorrow and the work that they do, the strength that they need to continue being those health providers. And today and tomorrow as they meet and they share knowledge and wisdom, that the minds are hoping to gain that knowledge, Nibak win. And we thank you, Creator, for blessing us with the ability to show that love zagiyeduin and to show respect maniji tawawin to one another. And we thank you, Creator, for hearing those words. As we lift these words to you, and we thank you, Great Spirit, Chimigwej. Kichimigwej niwichkiwe dogmigwej. I thank each and every one of you. I thank you for hearing this prayer, and I thank you for allowing me to be here, to stand before you as my relatives, brothers and sisters, to bless you and to welcome you into the homeland of my people, the Algonquin people. And just remember, hope is free and love is free. And let's love one another because it is love that is the true healer of all medicine. Chi miigwej. Have a good day. Love you all. Thank you. Miigwech, Elder Commanda. The CMA Health Summit comes at a pivotal moment in Canadian health care. Now, I don't need to tell you that our health system is in crisis. You see it. You live it every day. The emergency department closures, the lack of access to primary care, the shortage of health professionals, the long wait lists, the sea of administrative work, the list goes on. But as Elder Commanda just mentioned, there's also hope. For the first time in a long time, governments are making big investments in the health system and are committing to making improvements. Real change will take time, but it is happening and you can influence what that change should look like. 
Now, over the next two days, we will explore the areas where the CMA believes it can have the greatest impact on health reform, including scaling team-based care, creating safer environments for providers and patients, reducing administrative burden, among other solutions. Together, we will shape what healthcare should be. Now, we have a short video for you on the subject. The video is bilingual. The screen on your left will have English subtitles. The screen on your right will have French subtitles. For those of you online, you'll see the version based on the language you've selected for the conference. The prime thing that healthcare needs to be is timely. Healthcare needs to be safe. We still live in a time where our relatives like Joyce Eshaquan and Brian Sinclair can be treated the way that they were. Universal, accessible, de grande qualité. Healthcare should be accessible for everyone, regardless of their background, their origin, or their financial situation. We need to make the workplace sustainable and inviting to keep and retain those workers that are already working in our hospital systems. We need to be able to treat patients like people and not products on an assembly line. Healthcare should be about equality, but equality can exist within access. As an ER doctor, one of the biggest challenges I see is a lack of primary care. I'd like to see some attention and resources going towards building environments that people want to work in. Access to high quality healthcare services when needed. Je crois que les soins de santé devraient être accessibles pour tous les Canadiens, que l'on soit en région urbaine, en région rurale ou en région éloignée. Our healthcare and healthcare system should be trauma informed. We need transparency. What did you promise? What did you do? And what can we change if we need to change it? Reducing administrative burden can really help physicians and other healthcare professionals reconnect with the patient in front of them. I think having those opportunities to find that joy and purpose in healthcare is the path forward. As patients, healthcare should be by us, for us, and about us. Because without us, what is healthcare? I would now like to introduce Jennifer Ditchburn, who will moderate our opening session. Jennifer is the president and CEO of the Institute for Research on Public Policy, one of Canada's oldest think tanks. For five years, she was the editor-in-chief of the IRPP's digital magazine, Policy Options. And prior to joining the IRPP, she spent two decades covering national and parliamentary affairs for the Canadian press and CBC Television. Please join me in welcoming Jennifer Ditchburn. Thank you. Thank you, Adrian. I think Adrian took it too seriously that this was a medical association conference. <laughs> he, he has the right prop uh, for it. Um, bonjour, uh, buenos dias. I'm very happy to be here today. Um, I want to say, I think that Elder Commander has left, but I wanted to say uh, thank you, miigwech to her, and was remembering just in June that it was in this very building, in this very room where she was installed as the Chancellor of the University of Ottawa, which I don't know if anyone was there that day. I think maybe some of the staff of the Shaw Centre, but it was a, a beautiful moment that I think a lot of us won't forget. So, and she always starts events off in a wonderful way with a lot of energy. And I think New Brunswick has got a lot of energy. Uh, uh, so I, I saw that earlier. Um, I just want to start off by um, uh, noting on the screen, you should see my, my declarations, which are in accordance with the accreditation requirements of the CME. So I love the title of the opening uh, plenary, which is Canada has new healthcare agreements, what now? Because <laughs> I think it really frames uh, the issue very well, which a lot of us who work in public policy, uh, who work in healthcare, we're, we're wondering, okay, is this time gonna be different? Um, I remember just, it was well, almost 20 years ago being across the street 
uh, when they were um, forging the healthcare accord with Paul Martin and the, and the premiers. And so here we are almost 20 years later and the architectural reform that we, I think, all agree needs to happen, eh, not so much. So is this time going to be different? Is all that money actually going to result in meaningful system level reform? So we're going to have a lot of chance over uh, the next couple of days to discuss that. Tomorrow, um, I'm looking forward to talking to the new health minister, Mark Holland. Uh, and so hope to see you there tomorrow. But first, uh, we are going to hear about what Canadians think about the healthcare system, which is like hot off hot off the presses. That's also showing how old I am because I still say things like that, Adrian. <laughs> um, so this morning, we're going to hear from Shachi Curl, who's the president and CEO of the Angus Reid Institute. Uh, she's going to take us through new survey results um, on uh, how Canadians feel about the healthcare system. I'm sure many of you recognize Shachi and know about her amazing reputation. As she works with public opinion data to help further the understanding we have about um, the issues that matter to Canadians in Canada and the world. She often appears on CBC's Power and Politics. She writes for the New York Times, Globe and Mail. Very long bio, uh, and we're limited on time. Um, welcome, Shachi. Uh, so, uh, and she, I'll, I'll hand it over to her, but uh, uh, you come up, on, come up on stage. <laughs> Good morning. Um, and she's going to take us through the data and who does not like data. I work for a think tank and we like data. So over to you. So the microphone is on. Good morning, everyone. Je m'appelle Shachi. C'est jusqu'à 6 heures uh, pour moi un matin parce que je suis de Vancouver. So energy, energy, energy. It's always a blessing and a curse to be the first speaker uh, when you're kicking off a conference like this. I hopefully get you at your best, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, but woof, it makes for a lot of pressure then to provide a lot of uh, interesting information. Context is important in everything, and so I'd like to contextualize the data you're about to hear about this morning by saying just a few words about the work that we do at the Angus Reid Institute. Uh, je voudrais partager quelques mots à propos de l'Institute. Il était fondé en octobre 2014 par Angus Reid, he's a real person, enquêteur et sociologue. C'est une fondation de recherche nationale sur l'opinion publique sans but lucratif et non partisan, créée afin de faire progresser l'éducation par la commission, la réalisation et la diffusion de, don de données statistiques impartiales au public sur des sujets tels l'économie, les sciences politiques, l'administration publique et le système santé, etc. Many of you know Angus as the godfather of polling, uh, the grand pair. He's been doing this since 1979, but we founded the Institute in 2014. We don't work with political parties. We don't do client work. The work that we've done today, although the CMA um, news release refers to it as being commissioned, this was actually a joint partnership between both of our organizations. The Institute also subsidized this work. Um, and we do so value the partnerships that we have with organizations such as yours. What this model does is it gives us the freedom to be a fearless voice without having to worry about losing contracts or clients. And it allows us to tell it like it is. In the context of telling it like it is, uh, the CMA and per the CMA accreditation requirements, uh, I, Shachi Curl, have declared the affiliations that are not projected on the screen. I have no conflicts, folks. That's what that's all about. Um, the result of our joint work with the CMA is a 26-page report that's online, plus long en français. Now, to read the whole thing might put you to sleep if you're having time zone adjustment problems, like Dr. Narang, I know, is, is uh, still adjusting from BC, but more likely the results will be enough to keep you up at night in a bad way, and so they should. 
We talked to more than 5,000 Canadians from all walks of life, including your colleagues who work in primary care. Uh, you can access the whole report, get into the data tables, read the questionnaire en anglais en français par notre site angusread.org. For the time that I have with you this morning, I want to highlight five key takeaways, not based on what I think, but what Canadians are telling us. Five things. First, the patient, aka our precious and treasured healthcare system, is rapidly declining and everybody can see it. Second, disease in this situation equals lack of access. You've already heard some of that from the video that you watched. Third, more money can help but Canadians don't see it as a cure-all. Fourth, people in this country want us to stabilize the patient first, and I'm gonna tell you what that means in a moment. And finally, Canadians see the benefits of fresh blood. I'm gonna tell you what that means. <laughs> but first, for that first big takeaway, the data is so stark that we actually have to start here. What we are finding is that the last eight years in terms of perception, lived experience, and interactions with the healthcare system in the communities and the provinces in which they live have represented a real decade of decline for what has been held up as one of the, the best things about life in Canada. We have been consistently tracking over several decades whether Canadians think, looking back in the last 10 to 15 years, they feel that the Canadian healthcare system is deteriorating, whether it's improving or staying the same. In 2015, so eight years ago, people were evenly divided in this country between saying the system was either declining, 42% said that, or staying the same. And then you had the rest saying it was improving. That was about 16%. Today, deep breath. Seven in 10, 68% say that they believe and see that the system has deteriorated in the last decade. That represents a massive 24 point increase. While the number saying that it stayed the same has shrunk, and now the number who say that things are getting better, it's tiny, it's only about 8%. So I don't know how many of you have seen the old Monty Python parrot sketch for, for the, the showing my age, Jennifer, Adrian. But there's no looking away from this. The system is not resting. The system is not simply stunned. It is not dreaming of Norwegian fjords. It is crumbling. So what's driving this? That's takeaway number two. Let's talk for a little bit about aspirations. Uh, Marty Goldfarb, decades ago, was the pollster to Prime Minister Pierre Trudeau. And in that time, he looked at all the data and he figured out, oh, one of the key aspirations of Canadians is home ownership. That was what they really aspired to. In 2016, we saw some of the same themes around economic upward mobility when we did a very comprehensive survey, a landmark study looking about the values of Canadians. What was it that was bringing us together in 2016? It wasn't Tim Hortons, it wasn't hockey, it wasn't necessarily even healthcare. It was the opportunity for an economically upward life, upwardly mobile life. Those things are still true, but something in the last eight years has fundamentally changed. We also now aspire to simply just have access to the health care that we have been led to believe that, that we have equal access to, that we have or should have easy access to. The fact of the matter is the vast majority of Canadians do not have easy or any access to primary care. One in five don't have a family doctor at all. Those that do tell us that they are waiting days, even weeks to see that doctor, even if they have an urgent and specific need like, hey, I'm sick, I really need to see you. Only 15% in this country say that they can get in to see their family doctor in a day or two. And among those who have been looking, two thirds have been searching for either a year or more. A significant number of them have given up altogether. 
Remember, Canadians are told over and over again by their governments, by their politicians, by their policymakers, ours is the best system in the world. But we actually went and talked to Americans about a year ago, and what we found in, in a comparative study is that in the US, people are vastly more likely to tell us that they can get in to see a family physician. They can get in for primary care. They can get a diagnostic test. They can see a specialist. They can get surgery. All of it with much more peace of mind and much faster than what we're dealing with on this side of the border. And nor is the pain or the difficulty associated with getting that access in Canada evenly spread across Canadian population demographics. So who is most likely to have easy access? These are folks who are most likely to be over the age of 55. They're more likely to report having an annual household income of more than $200,000. Regionally, they're most likely to live in Alberta or Ontario. And what about those who are trying to find care and can't? These are folks most likely to be living in British Columbia, Nova Scotia, or Newfoundland and Labrador. They are, not surprisingly, unfortunately, vastly more likely to come from a lower income household. They are new Canadians. Nearly half of new Canadians, people who have settled in this country in the last five years, Nearly half are in this chronically difficult access group. So too are one third who identify as a visible minority and 40% of people who identify as LGBTQ2+. So little wonder then that those with easy or comfortable access are vastly more likely to report satisfaction with the system and those on the other side of that are most likely to be feeling profoundly frustrated. Healthcare may be free in this country. You'll note the use of the air quotes. But these barriers are telling us it is not for all. So if access is the disease, what are the remedies? Let's go to the third key takeaway from our joint study. Canadians do believe that more money can help, but it's not necessarily a magic fix. I, uh, Jennifer, you mentioned that the federal health minister is going to be hanging out with us uh, at some point over the next two days. I'm sure his predecessor would have been very happy to be here, taking the bows for his role in securing the $46.2 billion in new spending for the system that was announced this year. But Minister Holland's got to come and tell you all that uh, he's been instructed by the president of the Treasury Board that now it's time to find efficiencies. Um, that said, maybe he can take comfort in knowing the old saying that money won't necessarily buy you love or happiness rings true for our healthcare system, according to Canadian public opinion. Fewer than 10% in this country, when told about this new nearly $50 billion in spending, say that the cash will greatly improve the system where they live. Fully one third say it will make no difference at all in the community where they live. And about half say that money will help marginally. Um, people who work in primary care, so we, we poll doctors, those who are uh, nurses working in ERs and, and other uh, uh, specialties and, and other jobs related to primary care, uh, told us that they are marginally more optimistic about the impacts of the funding, but not vastly so. But we have the money, so where should it go first? Takeaway number four, we tested all kinds of potential improvements with Canadians and with the, with the uh, input of our colleagues at the CMA. Better measurement, consistent reporting, increased roles for those who aren't doctors, better ease navigating the system. You know what Canadians prioritize? Because we force them to. It's like, well, what do you like? Hey, we like all of this. But what if you had to pick one thing? They want ERs adequately staffed so those places can always stay open. That's it. That's the number one thing that they say would represent a vast increase in their experiences with the healthcare system, particularly primary care, and those of the people in their communities. And when you look at all the other things that might help, 
I don't think that I necessarily saw ER, ERs floating to the top of that priority list. But then I was reminded on the weekend, um, just coming out of uh, some reports in, in British Columbia, uh, about nurses in a particular ER being advised to call 911 if there was an emergency because there were no actual doctors available to staff that ER. So, wow. Other key priorities, I know you're gonna be floored by this one. Wait for it. Canadians just wanna be healed faster. So from the time of initial consultation, requires having a doctor that you can go see, to diagnosis and diagnostic testing, to treatment, to resolution, where possible of their illness. They would just like to see those timelines speeded up. No problem, right? You can get that done. That money will fix everything. But most importantly, and I think this is really key for you in this room to know, Canadians also have your back. They want to see reduced stress and less burnout for those working in the system. And they are interested in seeing programs aimed at alleviating that so that you don't tap out of this industry after all those years of training and all those years of work and commitment and everything that comes with it. So among the ways that Canadians see a fix and, and a way to achieve that is our fifth takeaway the benefits of new blood, of fresh blood. We saw in the data that at a time when our governments are announcing some of the most ambitious immigration targets in our, in our history, at a time, however, when new immigrants themselves are struggling to access care more acutely than others who've been born in this country, the majority of Canadians, nearly two thirds, are eager to see foreign trained doctors secure the right to practice in Canada more easily. Why? To Canadians, this isn't about concerns over standardized care. It's not about discrimination or, or keeping away or keeping out or any of the issues that, that tend to be part of this conversation. It's about one thing. It's about access. I'm going to say that again. It's about access. It's about access. That second key takeaway, you have Canadians who are looking for all and every way to build more access, not just for themselves, but for everyone in their communities, their friends, their loved ones. And they are more motivated by that than they are worried about people being trained differently or having different practice um, uh, sensibilities. So noting the time, and we're gonna have a chat. But this is the end of rounds. There will be a pop quiz later. Five key takeaways. According to Canadians, the system is undeniably declining. Access, or lack thereof, is the thing that ails the system the most. Money can help, but it's not a cure-all. With the new money, they are looking for stabilization at one of the most basic ways that people access care, emergency rooms, and Patients in this country see the benefits of new blood, i.e. opening things up to make it easier for foreign credentialed doctors to be able to practice. So thank you, and now we've got to do some more stuff together. Very, very interesting. We have Time for a, a short chat. Okay. Uh, so, this is so organic. <laughs> <laughs> yes, because we would do this anyway. That's right. Um, so, Canadians are pretty savvy about the healthcare system. Mm -hmm. They're dissatisfied. Uh, they, there's a bit of a, a lack of optimism, I think. What's the impact on the openness to a, pri a role for private care? as a result of that dissatisfaction. It's really interesting because we have been looking at this um, over several years and you are starting to see a change where people are going from a place of total purity around defending and maintaining the public system right. to being what I call pri-curious. So you've got people in, in three different places along the spectrum. You've got the private care proponents who have been in court 
fighting their fight, saying we need to go in this direction. You have the public care purists who are like, no way, no how, hell no, never go there. But that middle group, that, that group that is open and considering private care is starting to grow. And we're seeing that in wave over wave of testing that we do. We're seeing the number of people who are inclined to say that they either don't know whether more private care would worsen the system. Mm -hmm. That don't know is growing. They're not sure, maybe it, maybe it won't. Mm -hmm. um, the number who say that it will worsen the system is shrinking. But there is still a red line. We talk about, again, about equal access or equity in access. And that is the number one sticking point for Canadians. They will come right up to the line and go, hey, maybe this looks okay. Maybe this is worth trying. Third party delivery, different kinds of delivery. Maybe if government pays through the, the third party system rather than me having to pay out of my own wallet but where they cannot get past the hurdle and what's keeping them in that curious but not necessarily committed to private care or, or, or on board with private care um, model or mindset has to do with fears about what happens to lower income Canadians. And again, like that access yeah. point issue is so stark. Lower income Canadians already have trouble accessing and the great fear is that if you go private, and this is the fear of Canadians, that if you go in that direction, it's going to leave lower income Canadians fully and totally behind in the dark and out in the cold. Uh, we, we have a very short time, so I'll just ask you a, a question I think that will you know, be of interest to everyone here is, so you have this, this pretty strong opinion with the public about the healthcare system. They understand that money isn't a cure-all. Um, your, your numbers are quite clear. What is the political implication of that? <laughs> In the sense that, um, you know, for any political party that's looking, that might be looking at your survey today, is it enough for them to follow through, to be accountable on the healthcare agreements, uh, to take the, the system level change that they need to? or, or we, is there still a lot of work to do <laughs> in terms of advocacy, research, everything that we do? Well, generally speaking. Accountability is up to you in this room. Um, accountability is about educating your patients around where the buck stops or where the buck needs to come from, so to speak. Um, we're at a stage now where only 30% of Canadians are satisfied with the performance of the federal government when it comes to health care. Uh, that number averages out to the exact same 30% for, for provincial governments as well. Um, the highest levels of dissatisfaction are right here in Ontario, in Manitoba, and in New Brunswick. But a bit like inflation, a bit like cost of living, healthcare is also that wicked problem, that issue that successive governments come in and they say, we're gonna fix it, we're doing our bit, we're gonna do what I can. The opposition says, you're not doing enough, you suck, we'll do it better. And then they get into government and the conversation starts all over again. So how do you break that chain? How do, you, how do you trip that wire and change it so that there is accountability, so that governments don't feel a general ache, but an acute, like, head-stabbing pain around having to meet their accountability measures and have to be accountable? Um, that's really up to how much noise you make in this room over the next couple of days and going forward. Shachi, thank you. Sorry we didn't have more time to chat, but thank you very much. It was very interesting. <laughs> Thank you. And I'm looking forward to the rest of the conversations. Thanks, yeah. everyone. Thank you. Merci. We're, we're going to have a moment of transition while we welcome the next group of speakers onto the stage. And I am going to do a, a quick move um, over here because we have a lot of speakers that are going to come up. Uh, I'd like to welcome on stage three people who will be familiar to this audience. They have a unique, hello, unique hands-on experience as physicians, but also a really valuable perspective on what it takes uh, to affect change and get the real healthcare reform um, that we've been talking about. So each of them is going to take a moment to declare any conflicts of interest. 
Dr. Kathleen Ross as the CMA's new president. Just, uh, just happened yesterday, right? Yes. Congratulations. Thank you. She's, she's a family physician in Coquitlam and New Westminster, BC. Kathleen does clinical work in community primary care and obstetrics and surgical assist work in cardiovascular surgery at Royal Columbian Hospital. Thank you very much. So uh, I, in accordance with the uh, accreditation standards, I will say that I have, uh, I have the following relationships as president of Canadian Medical Association. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Alika Lafontaine is the CMA's past president. He's an anesthesiologist from Grand Prairie, Alberta. He was born and raised in Treaty 4 territory and has Métis, Oji Cree, and Pacific Islander ancestry. Hi, Alika. Thank you. Uh, and just like Kathleen, I declare the affiliations on this slide in accordance with CMA requirements. Thank you. And Dr. Catherine Smart was CMA's president in 2021-22. She's a pediatrician working in Whitehorse, where she focuses on providing care to children who have experienced adverse child, childhood events. Catherine. Good morning, everyone. And I also uh, declare the conflicts of interest that are on my slide. Thank you. Thank you. So Dr. Smart, I want to start with you. You were president of the CMA really at the peak of the COVID-19 pandemic, although I don't even know if there was a peak. It, started, it, was, it was misery <laughs> for many years. Um, when the healthcare system really was in danger of collapse and was definitely overwhelmed in many ways, what was your approach to advocacy at the time uh, that you were president um, to help drive attention to what was going on in the system? Yeah, it was a really interesting time to be in that role, I think, for many reasons. One, I think our whole way of communicating with each other really changed, right? Because we were no longer able to be out meeting, talking to people. We were all sort of stuck at home. Um, so I had to lean heavily into that virtual world and, and trying to leverage the tools that I had available to me to connect with the public and, and to really try to tell the stories of all of you in this room about what people were experiencing. Um, so for me, I, I think what that really looked like was trying to, you know, take advantage of every opportunity to be in, in the media speaking, but also really using social media, which was a new experience uh, to get out there to spread information. And I think for me, that was one of the really interesting aspects of the pandemic was that shift in the physician role. You know, so often we think about our relationships with the person in front of us. But during the pandemic, I think we had to really sort of reimagine ourselves as people who had to think of our communities and our country really as our patients and use these opportunities to share information, educate about what was going on, tell the stories of, of the healthcare system, the people in it, patients, um, to the broader public so that people, Canadians, could be aware of what was going on. Um, so that's really what I tried to do is, is to take every opportunity to get the story out, share that messaging, um, and try to make sure that Canadians were informed. How, how did you find your communication with decision makers at the time? Was it more challenging, mm -hmm. less challenging in terms of now you were using different modes uh, than yeah. perhaps in person meetings? But Well, what was interesting again is of course all our meetings pivoted to virtual, so pros and cons. What was The pro of that was you could meet with many people in the same day. So there'd be right. lots of days I might have met with multiple uh, elected officials from across the country from my basement in Whitehorse, uh, because you know you could just have these back-to-back -back virtual meetings. So from an efficiency point of view, I thought that was quite interesting and, and a positive, and I think that's one of the things we can take away from the pandemic is we can connect with each other kind of regardless of where we are. But it's never quite the same as, as getting to know people in person. So certainly in the latter ha half of my presidency, it was really nice to be able to come to places like Ottawa, actually sit down with politicians, connect with them in person, um, and really make sure that they understood what was going on. But I still felt like those virtual opportunities were there and I had the chance to do many meetings with elected officials and again really try to use storytelling as a way to make them understand what we were experiencing every day. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Lafontaine, as president of the CMA, so this, you come to the end of your term now, you've been able to further that advocacy for healthcare reform and see cha real, real change take shape and I understand it's a uh, you know, many presidents in a row working on this, but you were there when the federal government said, here's almost $200 billion into the system, uh, another um, $2.5 billion to support Indigenous priorities. And I saw you on LinkedIn yesterday <laughs> reflecting on your time, um, and you said it may seem like change like doesn't happen for a long time, and then it suddenly does, which I thought was an interesting comment. Um, what, what has it been like to be part of the momentum, but also the changes suddenly happen, do you, do you feel that it's going to extend, that there, we're going to, you know, that there has been this moment of change in this injection of funding, but 
that the meaningful work is actually going to happen. Yeah, I, I think you're talking about the secession of presidents and, I mean, Ann Collins and Catherine, I mean, you guys really laid down a nice path for me to, to walk on. I don't think we could have accomplished what we did this year without that. My year was really taking the crises that we had and tying them to the status quo. Because I'll say to the audience, the reason we're in this mess is because of the status quo, not because of worldwide events, not because of all these other things. We've had for years these ideas that we could have 13 separate jurisdictions in the country. We could all have separate economic approaches to you know, health. We could have different regulation. We could have siloed information, siloed patient care. I, I still experience as a border town in Alberta, not being able to provide care to folks in Fort St. John. They actually fly down to Vancouver in order to receive care, which is, you know, sometimes a 10 hour trip, you know, depending on, on connections and other things. And that, that just doesn't make sense in Canada. And so when, when we talk about the number one priority of patients, uh, we can't forget the number one priority of providers, which is healthy working environments. And, you know, one of the most detrimental things I think to us who practice is knowing that our patients are not receiving the care that they could have because of the way that the system has always worked. And so in this year, we, we broke, I think, a few status quo that are notable. I mean, with Pan-Canadian licensure, we've talked for 20, 30 years about having uh, licenses across different provinces. And I'll say with the PCL conversation, the power in it is simultaneous practice. It's not the ability to register faster from one province or territory or another. It's being able to practice in multiple provinces or territories at the same time, right? If you have that, suddenly if you have a patient of yours and you work in Quebec and they go to Ontario for school, which is very common, they can continue staying with you. They don't have to run around and try and find the family physician that they may not have developed a relationship over 10, 20 years. If you're in Atlantic Canada, where the Atlantic Physician Registry was open in May 1st, which we were extremely proud of, um, you can help your colleagues in towns that are half an hour, 45 minutes away if there's a short-term sickness or if you have a short-term need to you know, get additional support. And so I, I think when you're looking at the change cycles that have happened, 2004 was the second largest investment in healthcare transfers, if you go all the way back to 2000. We're at the beginning of a cycle. Right. Uh, if you look at this as markets, we're like at the very bottom. This is this is the lowest part of the market, I think. And we're on the way in the cycle where things will possibly go up. You know, 2004 led to 2007 First Ministers Accord that led to the Wait Times Alliance. And we all remember how things actually felt like they were getting better between 2008 and 2012. Then everyone declared victory and stopped working together. And so if we can avoid that in this cycle, I think we have a real chance of actually changing healthcare. And so. You know, I think when, when I said the comment, it seems like change never happens and then it suddenly does, I think it's because I feel like we're at the beginning of that cycle again. I'll also say just one comment. The accountability problem in the country is not us. It's not patients. It's government. We can't change anything in our practice unless we have support of government. And so one thing... And so one thing that I've taken away from the last 12 months is we've all been taught this lie that if only we work harder and we create more workarounds, we'll be able to create better environments for our patients. The truth is, unless government intervenes in a way that creates the conditions where we can do those things, we'll never change health care. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Dr. Ross, um, so you're really at coming into this job, this is an intense job at a time when the rubber really has to hit the road in terms of the healthcare agreements, the terms of those healthcare agreements, and the CMA has issued a really good roadmap for accountability <laughs> um, that the federal government could take a look at. How do you think that the, the CMA and other players in the system, other, other players that are really invested in in having a healthcare system that works, uh, what can what can happen now? What can we do to make sure that access provided and that the reform actually happens? So there's a great deal that needs to happen in order for us to continue the momentum that we've that we've built. This knowledge, this data that Sachi spoke to earlier, is is really a telling tale 
we know that the satisfaction in our healthcare system has gone down considerably. As a family physician working on the front line, I've been feeling this over the last several decades, the decline in my ability to, to actually see patients and deliver the care that they need. But now there's a shift, and I've been saying a little bit that Canadians are awake now to the reality that the healthcare system is unwell. And I love the analogy of being sick, that's perfect. So here we sit with this knowledge and informed that we have these challenges that many of us have been highlighting for a very, very long time and really uncovered in the pandemic, but they were there before. So no one jurisdiction, no one party, or, or as you say, patients, physicians, all these things cannot happen independently. We need to step out of the silos that we've been working in across our 13 jurisdictions, uh, calling them cylinders of excellence recently. But these, we have to step out of our cylinders of excellence and actually all start pulling together in the same direction. We know what the problems are. We've been talking about what the problems are. We've outlined how to efficiently measure these things. And yet the recent report by Kaihai really highlighted that there's disparate data reporting on how we're actually performing in every jurisdiction across Canada. Mm -hmm. So we have to have those, uh, those frank discussions. I'm really excited and looking forward to the action plans that are, should be coming down soon uh, as part of the bilateral agreement because those are gonna be tangible things that we can look at. Mm -hmm. The other thing that the survey really highlighted for, for us uh, absolutely is that patients recognize now performance metrics need to be discussed. We need to be able to say, yes, we said we were going to do this and we actually did it. Unfortunately, uh, in order for change to happen, we have to have that science base, that knowledge base and data saying, here's what we want to actually do. And we certainly need political buy-in. We need that political will and motivation to make change. But the important part that in, sits in the middle is society and patients' willingness to actually make those changes. And I think we're seeing a perfect storm um, of this at the moment. And, and I am optimistic that that hammer will hit the nail and that we will, we will see significant change. The other analogy I'll just put out there to consider is that most of the changes that we've been making through our healthcare system if I can speak about it as an analogy of cell phone, which uh, we've used before, that we keep just adding new apps to the status quo. We're adding new apps to our cell phone when what we really actually need is a whole new operating system. That's, that's hard to kind of cut everything down and start afresh because people have a path dependency. And what, just to drill down a little bit into the accountability question, what are some of the the principles or the, the priority areas for measuring the accountability? I guess measurement is one thing, the ability to measure, right? To, to see what if the change is actually happening against so, markers. So there's lots of different pieces that you need to think about because as a data geek, I actually love data. So give me lots more data, but you can't track everything in data because then you, you miss the point and you, you don't have any information that's useful. We've heard priorities from physicians in the media, patients' concerns about the emergency departments. We've heard concerns that people can't access primary care. And if you do have a family doctor, first of all, good for you. Um, but secondly, we don't have access to them because their patient panels are full, the patients are complex. There's just too much uh, time being taken for other administrative burden that, that reduces how much time we have available for patients. So we have to actually name and identify those and agree on measurements that we can track over time that will surpass a single government cycle. Because this problem isn't just related to one particular government or another as it passes forward. We really need to think a little bit outside the box um, and move forward. So what can we track? We can track the number of people that are coming through an emergency department that are CTAS or lower level uh, four fives that maybe could have been dealt with in a, in a primary care office uh, or in a primary care team had that been available to them. We can track how many Canadians are attached to a primary care team. We can track how many Canadians are getting testing and diagnostics done in a reasonable time. And we can look at, at things like the cancer care from your day you're diagnosed to the day you've completed your treatment. What does that look like over time? There are many, many metrics that we can, uh, that we can land on, but the starting point is to get that minimal viable product out there, agree on some metrics, and then let's start measuring against them so that we are all speaking the same language and being transparent with our patients. Unfortunately, what happens uh, often is that we agree, healthcare is in crisis. We, we come to our political cycle and we say, yes, we're gonna do something differently. And then it all just fades down um, into the distance. And I think we're all alive now to the issues uh, and we need to continue to have that as top of mind. Go ahead, yes. 
Yeah, I, I, what I was going to add is I, I don't think we have to burn everything down. No. There are some really great parts of the healthcare system in the way that it's structured that are actually quite smart. And we cherry pick macroeconomics in health and ignore things. It, it's, it's so surreal to hear about a doctor's crisis at the same time as talking about cutting the salaries of family physicians. Supply demand does not make sense in that context. And so I, I think there's a few principles that if we recognize and have discussions, which Dr. Ross is going to lead over the next year with public private care, I think we'd have a much better discussion. There's no free market in healthcare. You know, you have people whose lives are infinite value asking for health services. You will never match a price band. You can't have a free market in healthcare. And so don't treat it like a free market, right? It's a managed market. And so any, the most efficient managed market is one where everyone is in the same risk pool. So we actually have structurally the most efficient structural system. It's not efficient. I agree with you guys, but we, we have potentially the most efficient system. And then the question is, is how do we intervene? And how many of us have been part of a team-based care changes in the, in the past? You know, uh, patient care networks in Alberta. Those went really, really great, you know, 12, 13 years ago, and they transformed into something very, very different. The family health care teams in Linz and Ontario you know, they haven't funded a, a new uh, family health care team since 2012. I think they're starting to again. But all the best parts of health care, the things that actually were making a difference, government in their intervention has decreased the funding. And then it's increased the funding for things that lead to increased fragmentation, non-hospital surgical facilities. You know, we talk about how that's going to solve the surgical backlog. They've only ever done cataracts, knee scopes, and major hip joint replacements. You will never do a bowel resection in a non-hospital surgical facility. There is not the infrastructure. And the idea that you're going to open up private pay out of pocket care and suddenly have all these cancer patients receive care, we do not have the infrastructure. There is not a single private hospital that's privately funded in this country. There's maybe three that are opening up in Quebec. That's a trillion dollar investment. And so the, we, we have to start talking about the realities of economics and, and start to agree on these foundational principles that then stay consistent in our conversations. because. Patients just care about access, and what they're being told is if you can pay out of pocket, you'll get better access, but the system is not set up that way. Mm -hmm. Dr. Smart, did you want to add? <laughs> yes, no, thank you, I, I agree. I mean, I, I think what's encouraging to me when we're listening to what we heard before in, in this conversation is this idea of citizens getting engaged in these conversations, uh, Canadians being interested in actually understanding what our healthcare system is and what it isn't. I think over this past year, we've seen some really great journalism around that. I think we've seen a lot of great public education trying to bring Canadians into the conversation because, you know, I worry sometimes that it's sort of this delusion about what our healthcare system is that prevents change and that fear of really, you know, acknowledging, yes, the principles it's founded on, I think, are, are Canadian values, but the way it's being executed is where we're, we're failing. So I think, you know, having these conversations, helping citizens understand what's in front of us, uh, bringing their voice forward to government making sure that governments understand what people want, access being, I think, the most important thing, and where we're really failing, right? And that's the part that always seems to me so fascinating when you think about what you have really is a government monopoly on healthcare, but, but they have not delivered it to people in a reliable way. And that's, I think, where we really need to hold our governments accountable. This is a contract you've made with citizens that you are going to provide them with health care. And what we know right now and what the data is telling us is for many people, that is not the reality. Um, so I think we need to really focus on that aspect of it, the people that we need to be serving. And also, you know, why is our health care system spitting out and destroying the people that work in it, right? Because you can't, and, and I think so much of what we've relied on in the past is this idea of just do more, work more, work harder. And what we're seeing now is people are saying, you know what, I'm done with that. Um, so we've also got to acknowledge that we need a, a system where we can allow people to be thriving within it. Um, so I, I think we're, we're getting to the right place, um, and I think it's Canadians themselves that are going to help us get this issue across the finish line. So, so related to that, um, I, I know from the work that, that I do at my institute, there's a, there are a lot of wicked policy problems, policy issues on which there's shelves of reports uh, uh, with solutions of how to address them. And the problem isn't that, that we don't know what to do, but it basically comes down to political will and, and focused attention on the problem. So 
there is always a risk that once the money goes out the door, uh, the attention sort of fades because the, the good news is, is done. And then the change that you really need is just put on the back burner because as we know, things happen. Uh, so as people who have worked in advocacy, working in advocacy, can you share some thoughts on strategies and tactics for keeping the, the focus on action instead of moving on to the next thing, budget cuts and so on? Um, Go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, I, I think this year with the way that health agreements are structured, we've never had stronger strings attached. So to access the funding in the Canada Health Transfer, you had to sign on to a data sharing agreement. Right. So there, there is now a floor for sharing data in the country. In order to access bilateral agreement funding, you had to recognize credentials. All these things that you're hearing about changes with regulation across the country, it's not because provinces and territories suddenly woke up and said that this was a good idea. It's because they couldn't access funding otherwise. That's why Ontario adopted the Right to Care Act. That's why Nova Scotia started to change some of their things. That's why the Atlantic Registry, I think, uh, took all the work that had been done over the past few years and then suddenly accelerated it. You know, And so I, I think that there should be a recognition that the structure of funding is, is different and that's a really, really important lever that the federal government needs to lean into. Uh, and then the, the other part of it is, I, I think as physicians and as patients, we have to recognize that there's too many things to fix in healthcare, but we just have to fix the right one, right? If we achieve pan-Canadian licensure, for example, that changes the whole conversation about income equity. Suddenly you have family physicians as a group across the country, instead of just in their little pockets across the country. You're talking about health human resources. Suddenly we are in a shared market where everyone can move from place to place. You suddenly will get incentivization, I think, from different places to actually treat people better because they can get up and move somewhere else. You know, and I, I think we have to be very careful to not get dragged into these unintended consequences conversations because what those are are excuses for not changing. Hmm. Right? As someone who's worked in a rural area for 12 years, if Pan Canadian licensure suddenly came in tomorrow, I'm not moving. I love my community. My girls have, we live beside my dance teacher. You know, I have a bunch of friends that we go for barbecues. I have a neighbor who's an anti-vaxxer, but we get along really, really great, you know? And so I, I think that we have to this year and in years coming, not get dragged into these excuses for why things don't happen. We do not need to go slow. We need to be focused and move fast with something. Because if we change health human resources or patent Canadian licensure or any of a long list of other things, we can potentially change the system. And I think the CMA's priority strategic initiatives are a laundry list of if we change one of those things, we could transform all of healthcare. Dr. Ross? Um, I, I would agree with that as well. And I love that you use the term wicked problems <laughs> because there are many things that wicked problem uh, term follows into, but the key issues around wicked problems is that they're hard to truly define. Right? It's difficult to know who is, who is going to be able to fix things if you can't actually define it. They don't clearly land in one jurisdiction to solve. So I love that you've used that. In the Federation, a lot of wicked problems because of our yeah. structure, right? Mm -hmm. Exactly. So I think these are, these are very, very key. As a primary care physician, I believe to my core that family medicine is the bedrock of our system. People forget that the majority of emergency departments in Canada are run by family physicians and staffed by family physicians. So if we need to focus on things, yes, mobility, absolutely. Standardization of, of our human health resource and equal access is important. But let's actually put our dollars into the part of the system that's going to be the bedrock and solid piece. I think it was Biden that said, show me your budget and I'll show you your priorities. Mm -hmm. for, for decades, primary care in this country has, has not seen the bulk of investment. Uh, and unfortunately, we've been burning them out with increased administrative burdens of transferring to electronic medical records, increasing forms, increasing complexity of the patients, and more and more of our time spent trying to access care and find resources for those patients that need them. So let's, uh, let's drill down and actually see where the money needs to go to meet the needs of, of Canadians. Dr. Smart, I'll, I'll end with you, and then we're going to bring on some more people onto the stage. Thank you. 
Well, I think what's encouraging for me is I think what we're, we've seen the federal government outline are some of the key priority areas that need focus. And I agree. I think, you know, for the first time, we're actually seeing the federal government put in place some strings attached, some accountability, which has been a huge issue in the past with dollars flowing to the provinces and not being spent on health care, uh, even though that was the intention. So I think that's already quite a big shift that we're seeing, which is encouraging. Um, so I'm, I'm hopeful for that. But again, I think now it's our job to keep pounding on that accountability piece, right? As these action plans come down, as dollars start flowing to the provinces, all of us, and we need to be encouraging our patients and our friends and colleagues to do the same, we need to keep asking, okay, where are those dollars flowing? Where is the change? What is the plan? How are you going to actually make sure that people are getting access to care? What does that look like? Um, and we've got to be talking about things that we can actually be doing. Um, and I think, you know, we're, this is a huge opportunity in front of us to make sure that those dollars flow to real change for patients and for providers. Uh, but for that to happen, we're going to have to keep pressing, right? We're going to have to make sure that this doesn't become that news story that just sort of fades away and we stop talking about it and the pressure comes off our politicians. I think we've got to keep that pressure on. We've got to keep asking the right questions and we've got to be encouraging citizens to keep this a high priority because we know that's where the politicians are looking, right? What are people wanting? What are people talking about? Um, and that's where their interest is going to go. So I think our job is, is to keep bringing these issues forward. Thank you. So I'm going to welcome two journalists that if you read about healthcare, you will recognize their names, if not their faces. Um, Laura Osman, who's right behind me here, is the federal health policy reporter for the Canadian press. Over her 13 year career, she's covered municipal, provincial and federal politics and was introduced to health reporting in February 2020 at the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic. And Laura, I think you have a, a declaration. Yes, I'll just declare my affiliations per the CME accreditation requirements up on the screen. Thank you. Carly Weeks has 15 years experience covering national health issues for the Globe and Mail. Carly has been recognized for stories on abortion access across the country, the toll of misinformation on healthcare workers and on health system reform. And you have a declaration as well. I do. So in the context of the CMA accreditation requirements, I, Carly Weeks, declare the uh, affiliations projected on the screen. Thank you both. Hi. Um, I'm, I'm just going to let you all know that there is going to be uh, time for questions uh, in about 15 minutes. So start thinking about them. You can also put them um, into the app virtually. I can see them here on the screen and I have good long, long range vision. So that's good. Um, I'm going to put some questions to, to Laura and Carly before turning over to you, but uh, I just say to our, our three esteemed presidents that you can jump in any time so you don't have to <laughs> sit and li just listen quietly. So Laura, uh, I want to start with you. You report on the federal and provincial interplay around health care. Are you seeing anything new this time? Uh, any, anything that, that tells you that there's you know, this time's different and there's real hope for change? I mean, I think the first thing, of course, is that every Canadian was touched by the pandemic and nobody could hide from the realities of what the healthcare system was going through at that time. And those memories are so fresh for people. And so I think that, um, you know, in the context of healthcare reform, it's still front of mind for Canadians. Every single person was touched by it. The other thing that stands out for me is that, you know, I've been looking at past health accords over the years and trying to figure out whether they worked or not, right? Money was put in, were there results? And the truth is that we don't really know for sure. People can feel good healthcare when they see it or when they experience it, but in terms of empirical data, we just don't have it, right? And so one thing that they've done differently this time around is that they've said, you know, rather than ask for specific metrics on this, this, and this, they're looking at a system overhaul of the way that we experience health data in Canada because in the past, we've done health accords and every province has reported on their particular indicator, but that data doesn't necessarily compare well with data from another province. Um, and so we don't have an apples to apples comparison. It's really difficult to get a sense of, you know, what is the health of our healthcare system right now? We just don't know. So instead, what they've done is they've looked at the entire health data system, looked at how can we make it interoperable? How can we make sure that patients have access to their data? How can we make sure that we can get aggregate data on everything that we need? And they've done it on a timeline that's going beyond 
the current election cycle. Right. And so that's important, first of all, for accountability for these deals in terms of looking at whether it's working or not and whether the provinces are falling through on their province, uh, promises. But it's also important that they're looking at a system-wide change over the course of a long number of years, which is um, something different than we've seen in, in past health accords. Thank you. Carly, you, you've heard a lot of heartbreaking stories in your coverage from patients, from healthcare providers, um, and you're, you're, you're part of what's trying to keep policymakers and decision makers accountable. You're part of, of the, the, the bigger story. How do you keep healthcare reporting um, at the forefront of journalism? Because you're, you're one of many different beats and topics, and uh, some move up, some move down over time, and, and get more priority act, uh, prior, how should I put this, um, prime placement, whether it's on, in an actual newspaper or in, in a broadcast and so on. I think that's a great point, and I think we're at a really critical period coming out of the pandemic where we're no longer sort of front page news every day. And there is a lot of fatigue. Um, you know, no one wants to hear about COVID anymore or the fact that there's a new variant. Uh, we see that in readership numbers um, and just, you know, general public appetite. Looking at our healthcare system as a whole, I mean, you know, last summer we were in, a, I think, a different place where people were very concerned hearing about emergency room closures. It felt like things were suddenly crumbling all around us. And I think what's changed this year is not that the system is necessarily performing any better, but that there are a lot of other competing priorities and people aren't necessarily as maybe as tuned in or as frantic about it. And there's so many other things going on with wildfires, like just some horrific stories occurring. So I think it really will come down to a matter of um, you know, health reporters, the few of us that sort of remain in Canada, um, continuing to try to tell those stories in the best way that we can, you know, and, and, and telling some of the heartbreaking stories of you know, people who've died waiting for an ambulance to show up or you know, passed away in an emergency room waiting for care. I mean, those are tragic stories that we don't want to tell anymore. And I think that sometimes we've, we've been placed in this unfortunate position where that's how these issues remain on the front page. Um, you know, I wrote a story today about um, illicit drug overdoses now being the leading cause of death for 10 to 18 year olds in British Columbia. 10 to 18. A lot of those deaths were in 17 and 18 year olds. But I mean, there, there is, this is obviously an all out emergency on so many different fronts. And it, it continues to be our challenge, um, Laura and I and, and others, to make sure that the public stays aware of that. And it, it, it is a bigger challenge every day. Can we talk a little bit about um, the, the political context? And I, I touched on this as Shachi, but um, we're moving into, without a doubt, a pre-election cycle federally. Uh, and that's just gonna accelerate and amp up over, over the next while. What impact do you think that will have on, on change happening? So I'm talking about the federal level, but there are other elections. There's an election in Manitoba coming up. I mean, we're, we're always looking at some provincial election in Canada, but federally has a particular impact. So Carly and Laura, if you have, or anybody has a particular view on that? You want to jump in first? Sure. You know, I think I'll just say that I, I do think that it puts pressure on political parties to start coming up with solutions, the solutions that they would endorse if they were in power, not only from the governing Liberal Party, but also from the Conservatives, the NDP, you know, other opposition parties in the provinces. Um, we haven't heard a lot of alternative ideas from the opposition on this issue. You know, we hear a lot of the government has to do something, they need to come to the table. We heard a lot of that as the CMA was ra raising red flags last year and other healthcare organizations. We didn't hear opposition parties endorsing specific ideas. And so when they start to put together platforms and they start to come up with really specific criticisms, we probably will be hearing more of that from opposition parties. Um, but it can also stall process or progress, right? As parties start to look inward at their own interests in terms of staying in power, we see an election, there's always a period of renewal. It may slow down some of the progress that we see on these healthcare accords as parties look to the politics as opposed to the policy. I would echo that and just and sort of quickly say that too often, and I mean, as long as I've been covering health, this has been the norm. You know, the federal government will you know, make some announcements and then say everything that doesn't go right is the province's fault. And then the province will make those same announcements and say everything that's going wrong, it's look to Ottawa and they'll solve it. And I think that that's really what 
I hope changes. And I think that it's uh, you know people in this room, it's patients, people who are sort of pushing back on that election cycle, saying these are the things that we want to see happen. You know, we don't we, we want our emergency rooms open. That is a very low bar. We want to you know have access to a physician or a qualified you know healthcare professional when we need one. So I really think that it comes from um, advocacy groups, media, the public pushing during those cycles to actually see that change because I've, I've become less optimistic that the politicians are going to make good on their commitments to change. Yes. You know, the, the, only, the only thing I'd add to that is politicians are very sensitized to folks in discussions around health care, but in politics, you don't usually win elections with health care, but you can lose them, right? Nova Scotia was maybe a recent uh, ex uh, exception to this. So in, in the way that we discuss things for the folks in the room, it's really important for us to frame things in a way that's apolitical and actually has a longer track record than if you adopt this, you're a terrible person, and if you don't do this, you know, you should be fired or, all, or things that are worse. You know? I, I think the discussion uh, around polarization of the message is really, really important here because the change that happens does not happen as a result of how stressed out you are as you share your problem. It's the discussions that happen as a result of people paying attention to you. you know, and those, those discussions, they, they only get momentum if the people that you're talking to feel like you're actually hearing from them. So that the CMA has gone out of its way to make sure that when we lobby, we engage with all the major political parties. You know? So there's obviously the Minister of Health, but there's also the health critic from you know, the Conservatives and, and the NDP. And I, I would say that in those meetings, everyone is actually quite thoughtful. You know, people actually do get the issues. Now, there's the realities of politics, but behind the scenes, I, I think there is a lot of thoughtfulness. And so I, I'm not sure what will happen if there's a change of government or if this government receives another mandate or other things. Um, I'm not going to pontificate about that, but I, I would say that there are people in all parties who actually do see that this is a crisis and do actually care about fixing it. I'm just going to I'm going to add to that because I agree with you completely. I said at a lot of tables from grassroots all the way up to to the pol political scope. I've never met a health authority leader or a manager or a politician that gets up in the morning and says I'm really going to screw this up today. I think everybody's got the idea that we want to pull in the right direction, but where is that north star and what is that direction and how are we going to measure that we actually get moving in that direction where I see the challenges. So I'm putting you on notice. You have a few minutes for, for, to prepare a question for, for this, uh, this panel. Um, I, I made reference, I'll ask one question for all of you, but to, to the Federation. And um, it's, it's complex. I mean, we have 13 territories and provinces, uh, over 600 Indigenous nations. Um, we have the municipalities all working in, in the healthcare sphere. Now, the premiers have promised a follow-up summit uh, health summit, which Andre Picard, our friend Andre Picard, has said should be an implementation summit, mm -hmm. which I, I, I like the sound of that. But that's a that's a com it, we're, we're dealing with a really complex system where there are multiple players that have to be engaged in the change. Just wondering, and anybody can jump in here. What are the prospects for the provinces and territories? getting there together <laughs> on on the because a lot of it cannot happen in silos of cylinders right <laughs> it, they have to do it together and the health sharing is one of one one aspect of pan canadian licensures another anyone can can answer this question but it's it's often the, the source of problems in policy in canada is the structure of the federation so, yeah, yeah, go ahead. yeah so i i was at uh, cough the, the premier's meeting in july and we were invited by the Canadian nursing uh, unions to, to be a part of their breakfast and, and have that discussion. Brian Goldman was the facilitator there. And I, I would say that the premiers actually, they get along pretty well. Mm -hmm. Even those that you think don't get along, they actually do seem like they get along. And there was a general sense in the room that they all recognize that this is a shared problem. And that's one of the interesting things about crisis is it forces people to get together. You know? And this crisis has enveloped all of us. And so it goes beyond ideology now. It goes beyond provincial borders. And so I, I do think that political leaders are at the point where they recognize they do need each other. Now, what happens from then depends on what actually happens, right? Um, but I would say that the, the tone in there is not one that uh, is fractured. And even November, when the healthcare talks fell apart, and 
you know, the premiers came out and said, you know, unless the federal government has no strings and gives us more money, we aren't going to agree to this. All the health ministers were very, very collegial. Everyone actually was was talking uh, very highly of, you know, the federal minister of health, Minister Duclos. Minister Duclos was saying that he has a great working relationship with the ministers of health. So there, there's a bit of a dissonance between what we think is going on with uh, different provinces and territories and uh, the lived experience of, of those of us who actually are lobbying with them and seeing the way that they work with each other. Yeah, I mean, I will say that during the pandemic, these provinces were forced to work together, right, yeah. in unprecedented situations. And one of the benefits of the federalized system is that different provinces try different things and then they're able to compare notes. And then they were forced into a room for years uh, to talk about how, what was working, what wasn't working, how can we share our successes and failures, you know, and I think that that has set the table for perhaps better health cooperation in the future. Um, you know, as we see these health accords coming down the line, there's the there's the politics, as you say, there's the, the public messaging that we hear, which is often much more confrontational uh, than what's happening behind closed doors. And we know that those conversations are happening. Of course, the risk is that every province is going to go its own way once the federal funding is all in hand. But even the first minister's meetings that we've had over the last several years have been focused on health. For the first time in a long time, the provinces are sitting together and talking about this issue in a really serious way. Obviously, they were trying to get the federal government to come on board. Um, but I think that you know they're, they're on the same page in a way they haven't been in a long time. And that is encouraging. Well, I'd like to, to stop on that sort of optimistic uh, <laughs> note. And, uh, and turn over to questions. J'aimerais dire que vous pourrez poser votre question en français. Je vais les traduire avec plaisir. Oh, j'ai une tablette. So there's the most popular one right now. Okay. Then you might have a virtual one come through this one. I see. Okay. And you can also upvote questions on the app, which people are doing very nicely. Um, so I am seeing nobody in the room right now. I'm going to go to the tablet here. So, so, so uh, Shazma Mitani says, as Alika so eloquently illustrated, healthcare is not a free market. There is global evidence illustrating that two-tiered healthcare results in greater inequity and poor outcomes. How will the CMA use this evidence to present solutions to decision makers on how to build on existing structure and improve healthcare access? So I'm not president anymore, so. <laughs> I'll just mention one thing before <laughs> Kathleen takes over. Um, it's it's probably a ratio. Like if you look at international studies on pay out of pocket versus public funding, equity is dependent on the ratio of core funding from government. So the higher the ratio of core funding by government to pay out of pocket, the more equitable your system gets. Now there's probably a band there where once you go past a certain ratio, it doesn't make a whole lot of difference. It starts to plateau. I, I don't think we understand what that is, but. Once again, you can't have equity unless you have government as a core funder, and we know that from international studies. But it's probably a ratio. I agree. So thanks for passing the buck. <laughs> I, I think that there's, there's a couple of critical pieces here that we need to emphasize. Number one, we already have multi-tiered care in Canada. We look at expedited services for a variety of things, from work safe to IC, the insurance corporations to private care through, through uh, private uh, insurance. We already have this. We have some inequities in how we deliver care, covering pharmaceuticals. I can't tell you how many of my senior patients need a medication, even with the multiple forms I fill out to get them, can't get it, can't afford it, or will tell me they're taking it and they're not. Uh, so I think we have to be realizing that there's different differences in dental care. We're trying to level that up now. There, there already is multi-tier. What we're talking about is access to that minimum basic needed level of care in our system. And I, and I agree with you completely that there's going to always be this interplay of how much is covered uh, by our government and how much is actually covered by, by third parties. So that's that uh, out of the gate. What we want is we want to have those honest and open discussions with Canadians. And we've seen the shift in the mindset um, as and supported again by our Angus Reid poll. But the, the difficult challenge for us is to really understand what are those unintended consequences and who's going to get left behind. Um, as someone who delivers uh, a lot of people who are new to Canada and deliver their babies and recognize what they struggle with as far as access. It, in a developed town in, in New Westminster. So I, I think that looking at that compared to what, what people are experiencing in rural areas, it, it's just vast gaps in inequity already exist. Mm. So we have to have those honest conversations about what people actually want from their healthcare system, 
what we want to provide as physicians, what's that minimal access of care, what can we actually afford, because that's the other piece. We talk about federal dollars, oh, we need more federal dollars. There's no magical federal dollar tree. These are our taxpayer dollars and we are continuing to invest them. So I think we have to open the, the dialogue, have the conversations, and then find the, find the appropriate ground to drive policy. Thank you. I see a question on our virtual Q&A from Adina. And I'm not sure if, uh, does it come through? It come through the platform. Okay. Mm -hmm. Can you hear me? Yes, hi Adina. Yeah, hi, nice meeting you everyone. I'm very happy to attend even if I'm in Montreal. Um, I just wanted to say because I heard the uh, information just a second, I'm going to remove this from here. Okay. <laughs> uh, just uh, letting you know that I am a bit concerned by the fact that um, sometimes uh, we speak about uh, the private in um, health uh, system, uh, the, the place of the private uh, uh, for uh, to ensure accessibility, better accessibility, I think it's very dangerous because uh, sometimes it can it can um, provide like um, two kind of three, two or three kind of uh, patients that can afford and those that cannot afford. That I think uh, this is a great value that we have here in Canada is having a, a public health service. So I don't know if the private is the solution. This is what I wanted to bring. Thank you, Adina, for that comment. Uh, I mean, appreciate it. It's nice to see people from the virtual platform as well. Um, I'm going to move on in, unless there's a, a question in the room. Yes? I'm sorry, it's dark. <laughs> I can't see. <laughs> so uh, please go ahead. So my name is Angus Pratt. I'm a new appointee to the Patient Voice. And my question is very simple. What role do you see for us as patients in this new uh, realm that we're entering into? I'll comment on that if that's okay. Um, I think there's, it's hugely important to have the voice of patients for many reasons. I think one, you know, as we heard earlier from the survey, hearing what do people want and what are people's actual experience of the healthcare system, right? I think this is again part of our problem in Canada because we have a universal insurance policy. We think there's equity. We think the system's accessible, but it's not. And we know that because patients are telling us, yes, maybe I have a doctor. I can't see them. I don't have a doctor. So I think we need those stories. We need to hear people's experiences. I think we need to hear from patients, like what does patient partner care look like? How, how Do you want access to your data? How are you gonna use that? What do you want your relationship with your provider to look like? Um, so that we can evolve the way we provide care. And then I think at the government level, again, I think it is the voice of citizens that's going to make the difference, right? What politicians care about is what voters are talking about. Um, we're, you know, as the providers, we're a small segment of the population. If our patients, which is all of us are a patient at some point, out there talking about our real experience and what we want to see, then I think it makes it harder for politicians to turn away. So I think there's a huge role uh, for patients in terms of improving the system of care, uh, helping us do a better job as providers, but also speaking up to government uh, and making sure that we get the attention that we need on this issue. You know, I'll mention real quickly too, there needs to be a transition in how we measure. Mm -hmm. So what do we measure right now? If you look at Ontario's quality improvement metrics, I'd say almost 90% are all about volume at cost, right? Nothing about patient experience, nothing about whether or not the care that you received solved your problem. We need patients to tell us what to measure differently. And if you're not around the table, we won't actually know what to measure. Hmm. It's, in, it's interesting because I have worked on Parliament Hill for, for almost 20 years. I think people underestimate the power of an emails to your local, your, to your MP. And if, uh, if hundreds of people suddenly email the MP, they're gonna bring it to caucus and say, we have a problem and I'm getting, I'm hearing it at the constituency level. And uh, so that's always my advice to people, email your MP or call their office. I, I'll, there's another question, I can't see you, but please go ahead. <laughs> Ani Michelle from uh, Treaty 4, Saskatchewan. Uh, although I'm representing Ontario. <laughs> Woohoo! I agree. <laughs> um, I am really, uh, uh, I, I, I have had the doctor's experience and I appreciate that. But I've also had the pleasure of a lot of medicine people in my life. And when this uh, pandemic started, I don't recall there ever anybody 
uh, calling together the medicine people of the world because in every indigenous communities there are medicine people that know the land and know the medicines that's required. Um, you took away our doulas, you took away our midwives, and you took away our elders during this pandemic. And I still find them missing in the hospitals from even what I've experienced. So I'm wondering if you've got all this extra money, when is the money going to be extended to them who actually can do preventative measures and can be, do, be your frontline peoples before you even have to walk into that hospital? And I say this because there's a lot of remote communities, First Nations communities that rely on their medicine people because they don't have access to the doctors and the nurses that we do here in the city. Thank you. So I, I tell you that a, a place that you could look at in the country that did this really well was actually Marsha Anderson at uh, University of Manitoba with uh, the Manitoba government. So Marsha's uh, internist to First Nation uh, descent, she's also over at the medical school in a leadership position. She was going into community and doing exactly <laughs> what you said, having community get engaged, having people who drove health within the community get engaged and was bringing that information to help inform the way that pandemic response worked. And I, I think there was a lot of lives saved as a result of, of that connection. Now, the, the broader part of how do you include people and how do you figure out the line of where healthcare ends and where community care begins? Because I think there's a real danger in corporatizing community-based healthcare, of having folks who provide traditional medicine and other things and having them get assimilated into what we call you know, mainstream medicine and trying to create uh, the same sort of structures. We know that it's way more expensive to see someone in a hospital than it is to treat them in the community, right? Have a person get long-term care in a hospital is thousands of dollars a day, hundreds of dollars a day in the community. And so I do agree with you. We have to make that shift towards supporting community. And I think with social determinants of health, there needs to be a transition from talking about social determinants to just saying it's infrastructure funding. You know, people in the community need to be supported. And so I 100% I agree with you and that, that transition has to happen. Yeah, I agree. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I, unfortunately, we've run out of time and I know there's a lot of questions and I always feel terrible having to cut things off. Um, but there, there are many more sessions today. Um, I know the presidents aren't going anywhere. Uh, Laura and Carly might be going somewhere because there's, they're usually on deadline. Thank you, Shachi, for a great presentation. And um, I'll be moderating part two of this particular conversation tomorrow uh, with Dr. Ross and with uh, new health minister, Mark Holland. So hope to see you then. And uh, Adrian, over to you. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jennifer. Thank you to the panel for a very engaging, uh, very spirited discussion. I think that there are a lot of provocative questions that were presented and we're going to be trying to find more solutions to these questions, answer these questions over the next two days. So thank you. Thank you so much for that.